So we're here to talk about building collaboration and cooperation across transformative networks. And we have an amazing panel of folks and I wanna give us all the chance to check in. Um, I'm gonna be pasting their, their bios that they provided to the conference in the chat. Um, so you can read about them there, but I really just wanna help us ground together in presence. And um, we have Aaron Dunford here from the Emergence Network. We have Manise Jane here from Ecoversities. Kareen Bell from the Rooted Global Village was supposed to be here with us today, but they are caring for a family need right now. Um, and so I wanna invite us to hold their presence here and I'll share some inquiries they are holding as well um, before we get too far along. Um, we also have Mendahi Bastida of the Earthrise Collective and Deborah Benham of the Transition Network. Um, and so I guess in that order, I think, Aaron, you're the first to hop on the call. I want to invite you in just to check in. How's it going today? Who are you in this moment? We all wear so many identities that relate to how we coordinate and collaborate and which of those are alive for you and just how are you showing up? Thanks, Tyler. Hi, everybody. Morning, afternoon, nighttime. Um, I'm cold. My my fingers feel like I was just noticing. I, I wish I had a little blanket or something like that. Um, yeah, it's fall in Oaxaca. Um, it's beautiful. I'm feeling like I'm shape shifting. Um, very intense time these last few months. Um, we're at the Emergence Network hosting another convergence that starts on Wednesday called Becoming Monster. And so I feel a little bit like I'm a monster. And I kind of like move back and forth between semi human and monster. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, honey. I just got a little blanket. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, and we're getting ready for the Day of the Dead. Our altar is here. We're starting to build it and um, just thinking a lot about ancestry and um, spirits and um, how we have all these guides that support us and, and how beautiful that is. And also some of the patterns that are really hard to break out of is one of the things that I've noticed um, over the last few weeks and months and even in the um, comp this conference, you know, around teaching and uh, the difference between teaching and mentorship. And yeah, so I'm alive, I'm cold, I'm a little bit warmer than I was before and preparing. Wonderful. So glad to be here with you. Manish, can I turn it over to you? How are you arriving? Who are you as you're arriving? Yes, namaste to everyone. Um, I am right now at home in Udaipur, Rajasthan in India, and it's evening time. Uh, um, just came home for a little while to for this call. Um, every Saturday night for the last 15 years, we've been hosting a, <clears throat> a Saturday cafe, gift culture, intergenerational, slow food, Cafe, which is really around the same theme of weaving, collaboration, connection with other people around our city and um, nearby villages. So um, it's kind of one of my favorite days of the week. Uh, it happens every 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 uh, Saturday. Like, oh, is that Saturday already? <laughs> that was really fast. But this is a really, really beautiful way for us to really keep meeting people and connecting and supporting people beautiful people in Udaipur, and so I'm just holding that energy right now as a host and a weaver and a connector, um, and wonderful to be on this panel with uh, several dear friends and several new friends, so thank you, yes, Tyler. Wonderful, good to be here with you. Vindahi, can I turn it over to you? How are you? Yes. Hey. Thank you. My name is Mindaje Bastida uh, from the Otomi Toltec peoples from Central Mexico. I'm here I'm representing the Earth Rise Collective and also the Earth Elders. And uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you through this uh, collaboration and coming together. We call this unification process, uh, bringing back the ancestral ways of being, doing, and feeling. And uh, um, we are here in Central Mexico, uh, preparing ourselves for the Days of the Dead. 
because there are several days and we prepare for several days and it's so beautiful so beautiful to be in this way of living because then there is not just the consciousness the consciousness of the what is coming but who we are honoring our ancestors and honoring the beings around us so i'm so glad to be with you and to learn from each other comedy thank you thank you Madraki. deborah over to you how are you arriving who are you as you were around hi Tyler. hi everyone um I'm the well currently I'm in Boston and it's early morning but I'm usually based in the UK on the south coast and I actually travel back there tonight after being here for five works uh, five weeks still half asleep visiting friends and family um, my husband's from here and I'm the co-lead of the transition network um, support organization that supports transition towns around the world and I'm also a informal transformative educator yeah so um uh I think I'm a bit sleepy and a bit discombobulated because I think part of my soul has already left to travel back home to the co-housing where I live and my family. And I'm a little bit like, oh yeah, do this thing today and then go and pack my suitcase. <laughs> so, but it's really nice to be here and I'm excited for the conversation. Wonderful. And as I said, I just want to present that Corrine Bell is not able to join us, um, but I'm gonna post their bio in the chat and I might bring in some inquiries that Corrine shared with us earlier in the week as we get forward in the conversation. Um, okay, so I am a bit of a definitions nerd and just wanted to help us set some context here. We have this title of Building Collaboration and Cooperation Across Transformative Networks. And I, I have a sense we all know what that's pointing at, but I would love us to tease apart, what's the value, the distinct value in the word collaboration? And what's the distinct value in the word cooperation that we're holding for? Are they the same? What's what's difference? How do we know when one's happening versus the other is happening? And how does that help us have a better conversation here today? And so I leave that open to any anyone here on this panel. I just have a few things to say. Susan, can I can I interrupt? I'm open to you joining in later in the call, but I do want to give the floor first to the, the panelists. Fine. Yeah, thank you, though. Go ahead, Deborah. I think this is a really interesting question because um, at Transition Network, we've explored several times um, how much and whether to collaborate with different change making networks and organizations and often found that we have really limited capacity as a small team representing a big movement for doing collaboration well and collaboration has sometimes felt like you know really doing a, a shared project um, and really aligning around activities and usually quite a lot of planning and investment of sort of time and, and so on and I'm really interested in this word cooperation as a living systems principal, uh, as a biologist and, <laughs> and someone that sort of likes to learn from nature about how we can, you know, operate human culture and societies more regeneratively. And sometimes, yeah, I like to think about that kind of idea of being a network of transformative change makers and how do we uplift and amplify each other's work and look for the kind of leverage points of cooperation but also look for how we have our own niches and um, activities, I guess, that we can specialize in while also recognizing that others are doing something aligned and helpful that's part of the kind of cooperative ecosystem of change making. So I, I guess that's that's one thought that came into my head when you said collaboration and cooperation, that cooperation can be slightly different in that way. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Go ahead, Mindahi. And for the panelists, feel free to just kind of flow in conversation. I don't want to be in a role of, of calling on you each time. Yeah. You know, these concepts are very really similar, but at the same time, they are quite uh, 
different because uh, cooperation uh, when we ask for cooperation we can give some service once or twice or three times but with no full engagement you can cooperate something but collaboration is to to come together to really and there are different levels of, of uh, even uh, of uh, collaboration that uh, I want to bring this concept of compadrazgo, you know, uh, from for fathers and for, uh, for, for godmothers and godfathers, when we build communities in a sacred way. So that's uh, that, that's the kind of collaboration we are looking for because it implies not just the material but the spiritual sense of belonging. So uh, collaboration really implies even institutional arrangements, contacts, and whatever. But I want to bring the also the the sacred world. Uh, when you collaborate in, in in a secret way, when you give your word, is is enough, and you don't need even institutional arrangements. But in this world. We have to transit from both sides uh, to inti institutional arrangements and to the sacred world. So we are looking for that kind of collaboration that is meaningful for transcendence. So uh, collaboration is more meaningful for local communities, for ecologies, for uh, local landscapes and landscapes, because uh, cooperation and it can mean anything, you know, like there is no real commitment uh, or follow-up. When you collaborate, yes, there is more, more uh, engagement or uh, even not engagement as we think in the Western kind of world, but the touch, the how you are presented in this world in the collective way of being. Uh, that's the reason uh, the, the concept of compadrazgo, we have very developed in the Americas, the compadrazgo. You ask to somebody else to support your family, and uh, maybe that family is going to ask to another family, and they become family. So what, what I mean is that this collaboration concept could support life systems could support the way of being in this world because there is then a, a deep engagement in what we do. It's not just one time collaboration, it's long term. Maybe uh, as I say, it's, there are different levels, but what we are looking for is the long, long ways of coming together. So thank you. I can I can jump in uh, just building on what Mindai is saying. For me, actually, when I hear these words, it, they feel very um, somehow institutional, as you were saying, Mindai. Um, and they don't generate a real, um, you know, emotional or spiritual uh, 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 energy in me anymore. Maybe I've heard them too many times and too many networks and organizations. And so I, I would offer that we bring in some other words, which I know you love me, Mahai, uh, Mindai, and Aaron, and others. So let, I would say, let's talk about love. Maybe it's a little early in the conversation, but let's get to it. Because unless we fall in love again, we're not going to do anything. And uh, what does that mean, I think, is something to go in together. And but uh, one of the words in, in, in um, Hindi, which I feel is very powerful and important in all of this is seva. Seva and this sense of uh, divine service, this deeper connection that we already have. Um, this melting away of you versus me or my organization versus your organization. I think we need to start to explore what that is in a deeper way. Um, I know with Aaron, I've been... Uh, known Aaron for almost 20 years. And I think really that is the way we practice. We've talked a long time about, you know, friendship, relationality, 
um, melting of a lot of these barriers we've created between us, you know, a sense of togetherness in the journey. So it's not just organizational things, but, you know, my family knows Aaron or uh, Aaron's family knows me. And th this is the kind of thing we need to talk about a little bit more. These formalities we've created are, you know, become barriers, I think, at a certain point. And then we use this language it's artificial, but the people we love, we don't, we don't, I don't usually use this word collaboration and cooperation within that. But if I had to say anything around this is where I feel like um, um, probably the sense of, of uh, when I think important aspect today is how we think about how we share our wealth with each other and wealth, not just, actually, I don't consider money even in that, but it could be money, but how do we share our real wealth with each other in meaningful ways? Um, and how do we generate a sense of deep care and abundance? Uh, I think this is what uh, are some of the questions I would hold around this, this conversation. So over to uh, whoever's next. Thanks, Anish. Um, yeah, I was just going to say words, 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 like, uh, really resonate a lot with what you just said, Manish, around, like, I just sometimes feel like I just use these words because they're what we're supposed to say, or it's the easiest, most accessible way to try to describe what we're up to. But I actually think that, um, yeah, it's more complicated. And I noticed that there's kind of this tendency to um, put in a hierarchy or a binary, like, oh, cooperation is um, less than collaboration. And just like noticing that tendency of the comparative mind is really interesting to me. And it feels like part of that tendency of white modernity of like categorizing and classifying and so I can break down those words and think about how it feels like operation feels much more mechanical and sort of um, separate parts that work together and maybe collaboration, labor um, feels a little more organic. But at the end of the day, these, as, as Manish said, these words have kind of stopped having that much meaning because it's more about how it feels, you know, I think we could say that something feels um, generative and that sense of solidarity that you're talking about, Manish, as well. Um, at the Emergence Network, you know, these concepts of like spillage and of really um, questioning the hyper-individualized nature of our current dominant systems, which is the individual person, but it's also these individual entities, right? So we've created these NGOs and these networks, but they're very separate um, so how do we spill? And then how does that spillage actually create more strength? And um, yeah, I don't want to say resilience because that's another one. But uh, for a long time, the community where Manish and Yeo and others of us met, the Burkana Exchange, talked about healthy and resilient communities. Um, but how, how does it bring more of what we want to cultivate in the world and ourselves and our relationships? So if that's love, if that's generativity, if that's um, learning, uh, growth in the sense of like, yeah, being able to be more present and um, attentive to what we actually feel going on rather than some, yeah, kind of goal that we're trying to get to, which is brings a little bit of the question of, um, uh, you know, the question of transformation is interesting to me too. A lot of these words have this connotation of someday arriving and I don't really believe in that anymore I think we're gonna always be in process thanks Erin Deborah I saw you yeah go for it. <laughs> uh it's very interesting what um Erin was saying about words 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 because yeah as someone coming from a kind of ecological perspective I see cooperation as the much more exciting word um because in nature it's the way that mutual benefit is created between you know different species and different parts of an ecosystem so cooperation is a word that's really alive in me because i see the living world as intrinsically cooperative um and there's this kind of dominant western worldview that living systems are competitive whereas you know um incredible elders who are now past such as lynn margulis showed that 
you know, the world is really more intrinsically cooperative and designed to create mutual flows of exchange and value and benefit and care. Um, and so for me, I love that word and I love the words mutualism and symbiosis to look at the ways that we humans and we as organizations are mutually interdependent and related all the time. Um, and it's kind of almost impossible for anything that we do in a local community or an ecosystem or an organization to not be already in mutual interdependencies with everything else in the wider system. <laughs> Uh, but yes, I completely agree with what everyone's saying about what we're looking for is ways to create, you know, close, close relationships based on association and love and relationship and flow of exchange that happens in a more natural way. Um, and I'm really interested in that at the local community level, obviously working with transition towns, looking at how local people start to build that sense of um mutual yeah mutualism and interdependence and remember that they already are and i think all, all of these things are, are words that get in the way of maybe remembering that we already are interdependent with each other and exchanging all the time um so yeah i, I guess if we it's hard because if we, it's difficult are we talking there's two various levels we can talk at talking at the local community level and how local communities can work together to create the kind of the preferred future or the situation that um as Aaron was saying like the kind of a resilient thriving communities which is kind of a catchphrase now but and then there's looking at ourselves as people that represent organizations I guess and how we can best support and uplift each other's work what does that look like and those I think are two different levels that we could explore further today great thank you all I want to take this chance to bring in some inquiries that Corrine, who wasn't able to join us today, was holding, because I, I think they they provide a pathway forward to some of what I've heard thus far. And so I'm going to put a couple of their inquiries in the chat um, and just give folks a chance to, to read them. Um, there's this kind of theme around the economic component of trying to practice love in a system that doesn't always facilitate love. Um, so I'll just give us a second to read those, and then I'll I'll try to move us forward with a connecting question. Somebody can read them out to people who are on the phone. Thank you for that. I I will. Yeah, so the first is, how do we shift from operating out of scarcity consciousness to an abundant one, especially if we have been conditioned to be in competition or to fear lack? Another question, what does it take to build networks of trust where ideas, resources, and influence can be shared freely without concern for personal gain or control? Another, how can we work to unburden our transformative networks from the pressure to sustain us financially or emotionally while still acknowledging the realities of living within capitalism? And last one, in a time where scarcity consciousness dominates in many parts of the world, what can we learn from other frameworks and what practices can we adopt to foster communities of generosity and cooperation, even when we are still learning how to embody these values ourselves? So there's a ton there, um, and I invite us to, to dive in however feels right. I, I think I'll name that I, I heard this term spillage that, that I believe Aaron brought forward, um, and this idea of, of really just enacting love that Manish was bringing forward. And I think in, in what I'm hearing in Kareen's questioning there, it's, it's a desire to move towards that relational way of working that doesn't need to honor strict boundaries. Um, but often when our economic identities are these strict boundaries or our organizational identities have financial boundaries to them or other capital boundaries, um, it gets tricky. And so I'm curious how we break through that, that trickiness. How do we start to soften those boundaries that keep us from, from coordinating resource flow?
repeat that last sentence, please? Yeah. I think I said something like, when we engage in the economy through boundaried identities of self or organization or family even, um, that presents challenges sometimes for collaborating and cooperating. And given that the panelists are suggesting we need this messy, this spillover, flowing sense of love to actually permeate how we cooperate and collaborate, how do we bring that into the economic constraints we're working with? Something like that. I think I saw Deborah on mute. No, no, no. You, 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 you tapped close to where you were. It, it sounds the same. <laughs> I, I guess I, I, what I do now. Um, hey, when Warren, I'm... I, I really appreciate you wanting to oh, share. Oh, I'm sorry. And... I thought it was. I came in late, so I thought this was the end of the where it was just open question. Part well, of my we, we've got a, a series of panelists that I want. Oh, ask. okay. Part of my manager, one much love sorry and lessons. Yeah. Going on mute. <laughs> I apologize. Oh, good, my friend. Over to you, Deborah. Did you want to share? I mean, I can try, but I definitely don't have lots of really good answers to these mm -hmm. questions. <laughs> um, I feel like in Transition Network, we are pretty okay with the one about sharing intellectual kind of knowledge and resources and that kind of thing. We've always had a kind of policy from the beginning that everything we make is uh, creative commons and open source. So, um, but we've been able to do that from the privilege of having funding, of having grants and really supportive funders. And that's an incredibly huge privilege and not one that we take for granted and not one and not a situation that might always could, you know, be there. <laughs> and I know many other organizations that have sometimes had good funding and been able to do that and at other times not been able to do that and needed to charge something for their offerings. Um, I did really enjoy Mickey Cash Chan's session. It was like yesterday or the day before, but really kind of hearing more and then reading some articles that she's written about really deeply exploring gift economy and that there is quite a lot of work to do to develop a gift economy in organizations, but that it can work and it can sustain some of the team members, um, you know, in terms of meeting their needs, survival needs, financial needs. Um, so, yeah, I think the Creative Commons situation and gift economy are two practices that can help us um, in our organizations. In terms of shifting out of the scarcity consciousness or in a or a competition consciousness, I've definitely seen less of that in our transformative networks and more when I worked um, in more traditional nonprofits. I, I, I felt very sad seeing traditional nonprofits arguing and competing over small policy areas and also competing for the same funds and almost becoming rivals. And it does make me very sad when I see that happening in networks that seem to have sort of 90 or 95 percent overlap in terms of shared goals and then to see us factionalize or polarize or separate around sort of small areas of different ideology or different policies or yeah competition for resources um maybe the last thing i'll say is is just right now we're starting to explore a close collaboration with a couple of other organizations permaculture association is one of them and yeah i guess just really looking for the the mutualisms the mutual benefit what can we do together that we can't do apart and how does that actually attract resources in terms of time energy um knowledge finances into yeah i guess shifting to when we do when we do together it's more abundant, not less abundant. And to just, I mean, that's kind of just shifting our internal belief system and orientation to one of abundance. And I guess, again, we can look to nature for that, that when nature does things together, it actually tends to lead to more abundance and more benefit rather than less for everyone. So that I feel is an internal spiritual consciousness shift that we can make by having a practice around understanding how the living world works um, and how community work so if we have a felt sense of community we can see that when we do together there is actually more to share not less but I just think many of us in kind of western dominant culture have been enculturated to think that when we do things together 
there's less or that we have to compete for scarce resources. And I actually think that that's an illusion. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, um, thank you. That I really resonated with a lot of those pieces, Deborah. Um, I feel like a lot of it has to do with the scale at which we think something's important. And one of the things that I've come to question a lot is like kind of this subtle, even in the most well-intended networks and, and uh, intentional communities and efforts, there's this kind of often this kind of built in, we have to grow for this to be, we have to spread this good word, you know, and it sort of sounds a bit evan evangelistic um, in my perspective and how it, how the, the small and the intimate and um, like building these relationships, even within our teams feels for me so important. And so like sharing meals together or, being there for each other. You know, when I heard about Kareen, I just reached out to her. She's been a dear um, partner and friend of ours and um, like really practicing care on the, on the most microscopic level. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that feels inadequate or not enough, you know, given the challenges that we're facing. Um, but I think, yeah, weaving relationality at the most personal intimate level and breaking down this it's challenging it's a bit tricky but the line between the professional and the personal and you know I just Manish is my brother and um Karine is my sister and and so I don't know that spillage becomes it's it's challenging because sometimes I want to keep things in their boxes. You know, the silos are just easier to deal with and control. Um, but human spillage and the way that our internal stuff kind of just comes out is something that happens all the time. And so there's different sides of that. And I think also having to do with our socialization, we haven't really been taught how to navigate that messiness. And so just practicing being with it. And I think that's something that I'm working with a lot at 10 right now. Um, this idea of abiding with the breakdown and not being in a place where we have the hubris to believe that just us alone, little human beings, we're going to be able to save or fix or solve everything. Um, and that also means abiding with the human messiness, um, which sometimes is super uncomfortable and not fun and frustrating and infuriating. And we, we abide, we, we stick with it, you know, um, at the, at the smallest level. Mm, I like to take on that. Um, you no, know, this the concepts, the categories that we use. Uh, sometimes they are very. They support the understanding how we can uh, collaborate with how we can really become allies, because uh, in many cases communities or even the local economies we need allies to to really become and understand this world because uh, how the economy has been built is extraction, is extractive, this kind of economy. So how we can deconstruct that, how we can uh, really collaborate in uh, rethinking uh, those type of sciences that they, they are put in silos and they don't take into consideration the wholeness the interrelationship, even with the cosmos, meaning time and space. So, yes, we have a lot of work to do together. Uh, thinking about this, uh, the, the economy itself, we are embedded so much that the the coffee that is growing is grown in the jungle. Is the, the, the price are, are being set up in the big financial uh, places. So, but the, the care, how, how we produce, how we in, interact with those beings, with the coffee itself or with the, with the jungle, that's 
how we can share or understand that we are all interrelated, but how we regain our collective, collective dignity, how we regain original instructions, original principles to be. Because we need to go, uh, as you already know, from uh, uh, competition to collaboration, but really it's collaboration. It was at the source of everything. We, we just need to recall we need to, to come back to those principles. Let's remember who we are. We are just another species and we need to learn from each other, from other species. I want to put just one example. We are from the corn peoples. We are the children of the corn. And you can see that the corn is an elder. It's a being. In ancestral times, you know, the, the corn exists even in the, uh, let's say, in the wild, in the wild. But the, the wild is us, you know, it's just that we make up so many things. So in, in the, the, the grass is called theocentric. And then from the anthropocentric thought, we say, oh, uh, uh, the humans, especially here in Mexico, we domesticated the corn. And the same happened with the, the rice and the potatoes and everything. But it's not just uh, that way. It's the other way around as well. That grass domesticated us too. And it was born a biocultural produce, biocultural way of being in this world. So we really collaborate every single day, every single day and every single year in the in the seasons. That's the reason we, we have to we don't want to live in this linear time. We live in the cycles of life. Not to live faster, not slower, but it's in the cycles of life. And that's why I wanted to bring this example, this biocultural heritage, by your cultural memory, because we need to learn not just from each other as humans, but from other species, just to become another species. Thank you. Wonderful. Mendai, brother. Manish. <laughs> I love you. Um, <laughs> love hearing you. Um, I can jump in a little bit. Um, so I think uh, I can share a few things that I remind myself of every day uh, um, and all the things that I'm involved in. And one is um, that, you know, I, I I think that, you know, whatever I'm personally involved in, I find a lot of joy and meaning in it. And... Um, but at the same time, and, and I, I love it, I'm, it's beautiful, but at the same time, I'm, I remind myself that if the, in the face of the kinds of crises, the systemic challenges, that if we want to think at that level, that it's not sufficient. So I, I am sufficient and I'm not sufficient in whatever I'm doing. And that's a space which I would like to be in, that paradoxical space or invite other people into that space as well. Whatever we're doing, it's beautiful and deep respect and things. And given what's happening in the world, we need to be connected and, and working and together and playing together and loving together at a different level. And unless we can move to that level, all of these things will be, um, you know, will be great, but it, it will not help us the, uh, figure out how to get out of this mess. So that's, that's the kind of, you know, uh, I, I would let's say maybe the um, uh, humility I keep re reminding myself of is that it's beautiful and that we, we do that. And then the practical way of that is that, you know, one of the things I've been talking about a lot in many circles is unbranding. So around, so everybody these days is being told to brand their work better, blah, blah, and, you know, logos and all of that. And so how can we create a pedagogy or a movement that is around unbranding ourselves um, where and I'm reminded of um, you know in the 
In the Sikh tradition in India, there's a langar, which is a community kitchen, which anyone can go into. And it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in the world is where people enter into a deep space of, of seva. And, um, and when you go in there, all of these layers of ego, organization, title, whatever, they all are invited to fade away there. And then I'm there washing the dishes or serving somebody food or helping make rotis or whatever, but without all of these labels. So I think this is the spaces where, again, if we can create that kind of field, I've experienced that in, in these traditions, is where um, where we can actually hold these hold these organizational titles, labels, boundaries um, much lighter. I would I would maybe say put dotted lines around them rather than strong lines. And how do we stop, you know, like I'm part of Earthrise, I'm part of the Emergence Network, I'm part of Transition Town. I, I mean, I, and so I would invite all these, um, all, all of our movements and organizations to create a whole cadre of shapeshifters who can flow in, in and out of different organizations, be there to support each other, bring wisdom across uh, or needs or whatever help is needed, bring them across these movements, weave them together and and we hold many many hats we're all capable of wearing many hats and we forget and i think again the the rational uh linear um um compartmentalized mind keeps forgetting as mendai said who we are really um and that we can wear these hats and if we can bring that we can weave and we're doing that you know uh with across many of our organizations and i think that's that's uh that's one of the most beautiful things is that if we have these people who can keep weaving and connecting and saying, hey, Aaron, you have to meet this sister over here and this. And this is where when I, you know, one thing my when I was growing up, my father used to do, which I used to hate, which was, you know, he'd sit there and we'd meet somebody new and he'd like say, oh, do you know this person from there? Do you know this person? And could spend 15, 20 minutes, half an hour just trying to make, a, you know, the, the thread that there is a thread that connects us, you know, and it used to irritate the hell out of me, but then I started seeing the beauty of it and I started realizing I do the same thing. So, but I think it's a beautiful, like this weaving of our threads together that already exist and that, that this creates then the frame for radical trust. That okay, you know, we know somebody, this is their can trust. And I think we can do more of that across our organizations and, and more of the, um, I believe in, uh, in invest ourselves much more in the informal, you know. So, like even in the Ecoversities Alliance, we, we put our. I, I'm most excited when I see somebody without any without any uh, formal um, support, like show up at somebody's house halfway around the world, and they're staying in their house and they're meeting their kids. And these are the most beautiful things I think of of a, of a weaving across our different uh networks and and things and that if we can have more of that then um we are thinking beyond networks and actually start to think of movements or actually start to be part of a, a larger unfolding that is that is happening um with uh, around the planet so um yeah i think that and, and then the last thing i would just say that you know how do we um mm, the spaces to actually practice together and play together are very important um, to keep creating. And so again, the, the where I see that um, is that uh, we, even in, in the ecoversities as part of our, um, um, the way our budget is even organized a small budget we have is to, there is a budget to go in and attend each other's gatherings, to be part of each other's uh, Things to even to financially support each other's projects. We've kind of woven that in in a very um, in a very purposeful way into into the way. And even like, and, and I think this is the most interesting thing or toughest thing is actually you know introduce each other's to each other's funders. This is probably the, the thing that people do the least of. But I would push really, and I keep doing that, and I invite others. Um, and it's happening more and more across our things is can our can we connect each other to our funders or find beautiful ways to do that because um, that will help in the resource flow to 
to move that. And then, and then I think the question that we all have to hold together is what is this different economy we want to build? Because we know what the money system is doing. And so how do we start to support each other and work together really to build a different economy um, to support all of this, this work that's happening around the world. And whether that means um, more into the gift culture and different experiments like, Aaron and I do a beautiful one together, which is called the Shop of the Open Heart, which is really connecting people to even let go in this whole process of letting go. Take something that is very valuable to you, uh, like it could be your your a ring that your grandmother gave you or a favorite book. Or, and how do we start to let go of those and share those back into, into the flow, into the service of life? Um, to also like saying, okay, how do we take money and compost it into supporting more and more the things that we want to see um, and supporting people, uh, young leaders, youth leadership, for example, to grow around the world and things. So, so these are just some ideas, but um, I think that, um, uh, again, it starts with this idea of radical trust for me and how do we actually start to move in that domain. Um, Thank you, Manish. And I was curious if it, the question around um, ruptures and trust breaking feels right to bring in here. Um, I think our narrative arc has moved really lovingly and warmly into this um, embrace of, of these visions of, of deeper relationality and cooperation. And I know you're holding this question of what happens when there's friction and how do we tend those? Do you want to bring that in? Hey, Manish, can you mute? Because you've got like an alien. It's kind of in the background there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, it was interesting just listening to Manish speak about radical trust. Um, I mean, I think it's a fine line. I think there's, there's always going to be uh, tensions that arise and ruptures happen and conflict is a real thing. And what I've learned in collaborating closely, because um, the Emergence Network was kind of in this long incubation, like underground period um, for a couple of years. And we were doing some experimentation um, with like a, a very radical prototype of bringing together six people from around the world and myself to prototype the next iteration of the organ organism. We don't call it an organization, but um, and put everything into their hands, our hands, you know, and uh, it was rife with tension and difficulty because we all came from very different contexts, you know, and so even something like trust, someone was saying, uh, we're in the process of kind of trying to um, support a network of regional conveners who actually get together with other people in real life and not on Zoom to practice together and then connect them across this translocal. Um, yeah, we're calling it a common wealth. Uh, and someone said, you know, th there's so many different experiences and ideas about what something like trust is. And, and even some some of the people who come with incredible tr trauma and very difficult experiences of collaboration um, that ruptures that never were healed um, come asking for trust or come asking for safety in a space that they actually aren't even wouldn't even be able to experience that even if it was given to them. And I thought that was such an interesting reflection um, in terms of the diff the diversity of needs. So one of the things that I've been asking is like, we, we have different respond uh, re relationships to the, the concept of accountability. Um, and what accountability might look like for me is very different than it, what it looks like for some of the other people involved in our work. And so um, I think, I don't know, I feel like a broken record a bit, but there's something about, and this is part of the the ethos, I think, that we're working with the 10, and I think is also part of Ecoversities and other networks that we collaborate with, um, is like abiding with and staying with the tension and not, um, again, it's sort of the same on a fractal level, not 
tr thinking that we're going to get through it and solve it and resolve it and fix it um, to stay with the trouble of the of the tensions and and not abandon them because that energy is also wanting to be attended to. And I think it's something that's really present in our world today or our worlds today um, where the attention span is so limited that we can just turn away from something and there's a million other things that we can put our attention to. Um, but it feels to me like rupture, tension, conflict, it's, it's the, the, um, micro level of what's happening at the macro, you know, in our, in our experiences as, as, yeah, as a world today. Um, and so leaning into that, you know, um, there's this beautiful quote, I think it's, um, Sabam Fu Somme that says, uh, conflict is the spirit of the relationship asking to be deepened. And so instead of turning away, how can we stay with it, you know, and recognize that that could look totally different for different people. You know, uh, we all have different capacities to be able to stay in the churning and the difficulty and the tension. And yeah, those are some of my thoughts and it's not easy. It's really not. I could add something to that. Um, yeah, for about 10 years now, I've been interested in and exploring different ways of doing peace building and conflict resolution in communities, you know, where I live, communities I live in, and the organizations that I'm working and exploring in. And we had a recent experience in Transition Network with the, the UK-based um, charitable entity and our wider kind of international team of starting to feel like we were a, a two-headed monster. You were mentioning monsters earlier, but like a two-headed monster that had slightly different aims and confusion about our areas and it was creating various tensions and difficulties in the team and it was actually a really fantastic opportunity to do some of the things that have been mentioned in the last kind of round of discussion in that we we stayed with the trouble you know we explored the tensions as creative and as needs that needed to be expressed and understood and areas of creative tension and possibility and we we really went through, you know, we prioritized alongside other, you know, important work, but we prioritized a number of hours through several months of being together and building relationships for a start, getting to know each other, sharing our stories. We all live in different countries. We're on Zoom a lot, but doing more relational and playful and relationship building stuff, surfacing the tensions, just really surfacing them, putting them on a Miro board, asking, how is this for you? How is it affecting you and your family and your life, your finances? How do you feel? What's your emotional state around these things? And then looking for ways to build the relationships and meet those needs. And I would say we've come like a all the way around now we, from a year ago where we were feeling like, oh, this is a bit difficult and crunchy and feels uncomfortable to having spent time really exploring those and giving them some time and space and love and really hearing each other and getting to know each other. And more of us have been visiting each other in person. If we've had travels around the world, we've done what you were talking about, Erin, have had a little bit of money there that can add a bus journey or a train journey to then go and see the colleague that lives a state over or a county over that you might be close to and be able to visit. We've been doing that too. And now things are flowing so much better um, because we spent time with that. And that's been really fantastic. So, yeah, I just wanted to uplift that and um, give an example. Um, and a couple of things I was feeling interested in also from the previous conversation were um, Manish was talking about unbranding. And there's quite a lot of conversation happening around commoning at the moment in some of the alternative education networks I'm part of. And just looking at how do we create, you know, a commons of knowledge and a commons of um the work that we're doing together so i i really liked that and just wanted to add that term in as well um and listening to mindari um about that remembering that we're part of this living world and that we can learn from the other living beings i know that something that's helped me as a kind of hack for someone that is from a you know a western european culture is, is learning biomimicry and learning what the principles and patterns are of living systems and how those can be applied to organizations and to local communities because 
it's 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 like uh, the first steps towards redeveloping traditional ecological knowledge for those of us that have been in that separation of illusion from the living world and i think it can be really good stepping stones and i'm very much respect that organize you know uh, biomimicry institute and so on who have put together the 26 life's principles of like these are the principles and the patterns that all living beings and systems follow and humanity did for tens of thousands of years and we're largely not in kind of dominant culture anymore and um i think it was um high die um that was saying is there like a practical framework that you can look at are there principles you can look at for cooperation and collaboration and i and, and for me looking to the natural world and that kind of ecological knowledge is a way for us to do that that is it's that whole thing about not um we can't solve the problems with the same thinking that phrase that gets used a lot but it does beg the question where does the thinking come from then um and so for me the thinking can come from learning from the wider living world as mandari was saying but we can do that in really quite a practical way even those of us that haven't been brought up in cultures where there is traditional ecological knowledge it's possible to redevelop it by being in relationship with our land and listening to and learning from our land and also being supported by others that have given us frameworks like these are the systems and principles and patterns in nature that you can look for and then start to bring into your organizational culture so that our organizations become more like organisms as Aaron was saying anyway that's a, a long ramble I'll stop there can I add to that, please? Uh, from uh, the perspectives of the prophecies that we're living in, because we also work in prophecies, um, we have a beautiful prophecy in the Americas and worldwide, the New Dawn prophecy, and the prophecy of the eagle and condor, meaning that... Um, we have to come together. And not just at the end of the day, but at the beginning of the night. And at the end of the night is the beginning of the day, which is the new dawn. And it calls for the unification process, unification among beings, especially humans, because we are, we are the problem uh, this time, mostly than other species. So rethinking our, our way or, or our place in the world is a huge task, not just from the education perspective, but any kind of perspective. And not just from the material, but also in the spiritual world, how we connect and reconnect to the source. And uh, yeah, ruptures are, uh, sometimes it's not from the, even from the human, uh, agency. They come from other sources. And that's why we follow prophecy, because prophecy is beyond the human agency. And uh, and we are in this time, very special time in space. Accordingly with the uh, ancestral uh, Mesoamerican calendars, and even others from other parts of the world, we ended uh, a big cycle, and it has to be with a long night. But the, the, the night doesn't mean that it's all negative, no. There is mystery in between. Between the day and the night, there is mystery. It's like uh, thinking about the past and the future, and we cannot live in the past, we cannot live in the future, but in between. And that's the mystery of life. And then we have to rethink our place in, in these life cycles. Because if any institution, if any individual who is attempting against the care of life, they have to transform. You know, even the institutions that are very extractive for the corporations or even <laughs> with the support of some nation states, even those institutions that are uh, given this kind of education to be just to take over instead of taking care or giving care. Yeah, this is the time. And we have this big opportunity as human beings to remember and to recall the collective dignity 
it's not just at all, it's not anymore about the individual, it's the collective. It's the world. So we have to go from the me to the we. There's no other option if we want to transcend as human species. So we have a, a big opportunity. And uh, as I say, the, the disruption or the, the rupture, it doesn't come just from the human agency. It's come from other sources. And that's why sometimes we, when we pray, when we put our intentions, we say, stand up with this planet, with this mother. And we pray for that. And it's happening. Whether some people like it or not, it's happening. And it's happening very fast now. So that's the new dawn that I want to call for. And that's the unification process that is happening as well. But if we put our intentions together in this collective way of being, in this, because we call it sometimes transformation. Transformation for what? To do the same kind of thing, like the kind of the sustainable development paradigm? No, we don't want that. We don't want that. We want the good living. We, we want to be responsible for our acts. Not your respect, responsible. In reciprocity with life, life systems. Because we are the reflection of the sacred elements. So we don't treat any more sacred elements as resources. It's so crazy. It's so lack of, there's so much lack of respect to treat water as a resource. And you see many in all the universities in the Western mind and, and beyond, they treat the resources, the, the, the sacred elements are, as resources. We have a, a huge task to carry out. So then it's not just about rupture or disruption. It's about resistance. It's about the way of being in this world with dignity. So we have to recall not just those ancestral uh, principles or the so-called traditional ecological knowledge, but the ancestral wisdom. Because there's so much information, there is so much knowledge. But for what? For what? Science is not just uh, something that is, uh, um, how do you say, like um, to serve, but it, it has other intentions as well. And that's the problem. We, we have to recall science for the care of life. Otherwise, that science is killing life. So let's rethink about the curricula. Even uh, at the beginning, we wanted to talk about careers. But also, let's think what kind of humans we are delivering to this world. So these ecoversities, these notions of coming together, these houses of original thought, houses of original thinking, in this case, we have to recall other um, guides, other professors as sacred beings, like the sacred trees, like the sacred sites, like the sacred elements of life. They teach us how to live in good, in the cycles of life, in the good living paradigm. Come on. Thank you, I hope. I'll just say a quick thing. I know we're running out of time, but uh, for me, uh, just to add to what Mandai, Brother Mandai is saying is, um, so I think we need to call on ancient technologies, which I always look for when I um, um, meet people from different networks. So one being good food. If there's not good food there, something is very wrong uh, with the movement. 
um, good music and dancing. If that's missing, no, that's not going to go anywhere. And good prayer. Good prayer, good ceremony. And these three things we can bring, I think, from the is the gifts from the Global South that I think Ecoversities and many of them we're trying to bring all over the world is that we can call, these are the ways that we can remember. We have our ancestors, our elders have left these technologies for us. And somehow in, in our busyness to try to achieve uh, big goals and all that, we forget these very basic technologies which can really help weave and heal and, um, and um, yeah, uh, nourish us in different ways. Um, so that's one thing. And the other, the other thing I just want to bring in the conversation. Sorry. Hello? Yeah. The other thing I just wanted to. Sorry, what? Hello? I think it was. Keep going, Manish. Keep going. Someone... One other, other thing I just wanted to bring in is this notion that, um, see, a lot of this. Um, you know, there's a lot of, <clears throat> I'm reminded of this Zen, with this Zen stories of what is a disruption or how do we use these words and what is, you know, there's, it has a negative connotation, but obviously there's always, you know, uh, different ways and different things that emerge out of that. And so I think that, you know, for me, one of the fundamental challenges in, in all of this is <clears throat> we've been trained by modern education to think in terms of maps. And those are two flat, two-dimensional maps that we had. And, and, and you know, I, I have a big critique these days of Western liberal arts education because it's just a checklist points. We stop seeing the person or the context or the communities and we start judging them like we think we're God and we start judging them with some, according to some, some map or some checklist or some, some list or something like that. So I think that this thing, and then when it's on, on paper, everything is is very well aligned, it's not messy, it's, you can clear, make these boxes and diagrams and all these frameworks. And I think we get ourselves, I've seen so many people, um, which, we, which we collaborate, they get stuck in this, these ideological maps. And so what I'm an invitation is to come out of the maps and come to the terrain, come to seeing the person as a, you know, crazy, mes messy, beautiful, um, being, which is spilling, as Aaron said, or Bio says, loves to say. And and I think that if we can enter that in the space of, you know, paradox, um, you know, these are these words are like alignment, new age words, alignment. I started feeling like a real chill because it's expecting something to match up and fit all neatly and nicely, you know, inner alignment, outer alignment. And this is... Um, I think these are all, yeah, two-dimensional. So how do we come into the three-dimensional world, I think, is part of the pedagogies and approaches. It requires a different different set of muscles to unlearn that and to start living with what's present rather than a lot of the conflicts or things are things that happen. It's not even what's happening in the present. It's something that's getting triggered by the present from the past and things like that or some fear of the future. And so the more we can start to live with the terrain and let go of these maps, um, and it's not saying they're not useful, but I'm, I, there's a very deep shadow with it, which creates a lot of conflict. And that's been part of my own journey is to start releasing some of those ideological maps or even principles. I also get a little bit nervous because then you you follow the principle, you don't, or people, there's all kinds of interpretations and all kinds of cultural things. If we're And particularly if we're trying to work with people all over the planet, it's very, very difficult. So... I think we need to be much more. The invitation is to be much more present with what is, and 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 that might that I've seen starts to help open up a different space of possibility. Thank you, Manish. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this has been such a delight to take part in. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Manish. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Mandahi. Um, yeah, and thank you everyone for tuning in, whether you are on camera or off camera, your presence here was supportive. Um, so I invite everyone to come off mute if you wish, just say goodbye, shake your body, dance your way out of the Zoom room. We need to clear out of here in two minutes because I think there's another thing happening right after this. Um, 
But yeah, feel free to say farewell. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, volunteers. This guy Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. That was Thank beautiful. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thank you so Thank much. You.